With web monetization, it's more linear. If I'm a content creator with a small following, I'm going to make a proportional amount of money to the size of my following. And I think this is so exciting because it creates a path for the return of the middle class artists. You won't have to be a superstar or starve. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Amy James, the co-inventor of Open Index Protocol. Welcome back to the What Kind of Internet Do You Want series. Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel and let's get into it. This is part three of our mini series on the web monetization standard. In part one, we talked about the problems that are solved by web monetization. And in part two, we took a deep dive into the technology and history behind it. In this video, we're going to talk all about how to use it and how it works interoperably with other Web3 protocols like OIP. So let's get started with how to add web monetization to your own website. It's elegantly simple. Step one, get an Interledger wallet. Step two, add a web monetization tag to your website. That's it. You just add this one line of code to your website and it's ready to receive web monetization payments. And if you want to take it a step further, you can set it up so that your website will unlock some kind of bonus content or turn off ads, or simply display a thank you banner when the website detects that a web monetized user is sending you payments. But you're probably wondering how payments would be sent to you. Well, you can run your own web monetization client kind of like running your own email server. But since most of us would rather use a service just like we use Gmail or ProtonMail, the thinking is that most people will use a web monetization service provider. Right now, the only option is Coil, a company that was started by Stefan Thomas, who I mentioned in part two was the co-author of the Interledger white paper and the former CTO of Ripple. And his new company, Coil, provides web monetization as a service that allows users to pay a $5 per month subscription, and then Coil pays the web monetized sites that the user visits on their behalf. Coil sets the rate it pays to the website. Right now, it's a flat rate of 100 micro dollars, which is a hundred millionths of a dollar per second of browsing. And if you do the math, that comes out to 36 cents per hour, which arguably doesn't seem like much money. Creators who are monetizing on YouTube are probably receiving a higher rate than that, but podcasts often make much less. According to Nielsen, some podcasts are making only one cent per user hour. So while there aren't that many people using web monetization or coil yet, it looks like this revenue model could really scale well and result in great money for creators. It's possible web monetization payments could be the antidote to the issue that I talked about in our recent video about advertising, because the income from web monetization is more linear, it's more proportional. Right now, if a creator makes money with ads, the buying power of their audience or the data about them would affect how much the creator makes. Or with a subscription model, companies have to compete over the size of their catalog. So smaller companies just can't compete against the Goliaths of Spotify and Apple Music. And creators on these platforms face similar problems. Spotify, for instance, pays out royalties on a pro rata basis, which means that all of the royalty money is combined into one pot for the accounting period, and the artists are paid according to their share of all streams on the platform. So if a group of artists are getting 90% of the streams, they're also getting 90% of the money. With web monetization, it's more linear. If I'm a content creator with a small following, I'm going to make a proportional amount of money to the size of my following. And I think this is so exciting because it creates a path for the return of the middle class artists. You won't have to be a superstar or starve. Coil says its intention is to make using web monetization something that users don't even have to think about. And that's the reason that they chose a flat rate subscription model. And if a user visits more sites with web monetization than the $5 subscription that they paid, 
coil will absorb the extra cost. Right now, coil is only paying that flat metered rate of 36 cents per hour, but they said that it could get more sophisticated in the future and that over time they will likely tune it to find the sweet spot for various kinds of content or bandwidth requirements and what have you. I am very excited about a new project that Coil recently announced called Rafiki that will support larger and more customized payments as well. Web monetization is just getting started. So Coil is the only web monetization service provider right now, but I wanted to quickly shout out the Puma browser. It's a browser for iOS and Android that was made with a fork of Firefox with web monetization natively built in. They're not a web monetization service provider, so to send money to sites, Puma users would still need to have a Coil subscription. There's also Runaroo, Infinity, Search, and Mojik. <laughs> I don't know how you say that. I'm a big fan of standardization. It makes networks stronger and more efficient. The World Wide Web as we know it today is great because of standardization. It was standardization that gave us one giant connected web. It wouldn't be as great if the standards had splintered into different versions and resulted in many smaller siloed webs. So one thing I focus on when evaluating a specification is if it's open, flexible, interoperable, and decentralized. I actually went over this in a lot more detail in a video called How to Win the Platform Wars, so I'll link that below if you wanna hear me talk more about all of those ideas. But the benefits of standardization depend almost entirely on how the specification requires the standards, and there are lots of ways to get this wrong. Many protocols in the blockchain industry have rigid, closed implementations where you're required to use one specific blockchain or file distribution network or value transfer token, usually because the financial health of the project depends on whatever the required thing is. It creates an us versus them kind of tribal mindset that is bad for the industry and it's the opposite of what the web is supposed to be about. And frankly, it's spectacularly short-sighted. It's been really gratifying to watch the industry begin to change its mind on this. I still remember when Bitcoin maximalism was the law of the land and enforced by the thought leaders and the investment dollars. Back then, we got so many crazy looks for arguing that it would be a multi-blockchain future. Hopefully soon, more projects will see how important interoperability and efficiency are and stop trying to be everything all at once. You can't be value transfer and smart contracts and indexing data at the same time. Optimal Web3 protocols should use each other's interoperable tools so that we can stay in our own lane and focus on optimizing our unique piece of the puzzle, but <laughs> I digress. Open, flexible, interoperable, decentralized implementations mean that the specification can shift to meet the demands of a constantly changing market without losing the previous history and benefits of standardization. The web monetization standard really passes this test. It has the least possible number of rules necessary to make it work. It requires minimal coding. It allows for extremely diverse implementations and it works across many networks. The only caveat is it has a dependency on Ripple, which has some aspects of centralization. So in some circumstances, the spec isn't totally decentralized, but it can be used in a way that is. Web monetization is another piece of the Web3 puzzle, and it has the same kind of technical values baked into its design that we focused on when building Open Index Protocol. Okay, so let's chat briefly about how OIP creates a market between web monetization service providers and the content publishers. So the way web monetization works is that I put a payment pointer into my website and then I can detect if a user is sending payments. The CTO of Coil described this as the user opening the negotiation in terms of price, that the user has a certain amount of money that they can send per second, that 100 millionths of a dollar, so that it's up to then the site to decide whether or not the amount is good enough or not. But 
I, I guess I don't feel like that's exactly true because COIL is the only web monetization service provider right now, and they're the ones that are setting the rate, not the user. In the future, there could be other web monetization service providers that allow users to control the dials, but there's that classic tension between making something easy and mindless for the user versus providing options. And that typically leads to companies providing fewer options and just dictating terms because it's generally better for the bottom line. If web monetization service providers continue to set the terms, it has the potential to continue that kind of bad dynamic that we're facing where services like Spotify and YouTube setting the terms and the content creators and publishers just not having power to negotiate. They can either accept it and participate or reject it and not participate. Now the founders of COIL have mentioned in presentations that tuning their rates could be part of how different web monetization service providers differentiate and optimize, kind of like having different rates for different kinds of sites or different bandwidth requirements. But what I wonder is how the web monetization service providers will determine how much value they need to send for a piece of content to be unlocked. You know, what if the content requires extremely high bandwidth and this is extremely expensive to serve up? Or what if the creator just thinks that it's worth a high price point and won't unlock it until they've received a certain amount of money? A centralized service trying to reverse engineer a price point for each piece of wildly diverse content and websites on the entire web would be inefficient and difficult. And the danger is that it could incentivize companies to continue to choose those simplified models that once again leave the creators and publishers without a voice in the negotiation. So OIP could help fix this by turning it into a market where the creators and publishers of content can publicly declare their terms and their pricing, and where platforms and web monetization service providers can do the same. Publishing this information in a public standard index increases the efficiency of the market and it balances the power between the creators and the platforms and the service providers because each party can update their terms and their pricing as the market grows and changes, thus creating a kind of public, ongoing negotiation about the market price of content. So using OIP to record how much a piece of content costs or how much a platform charges or how much a web monetization service provider will pay puts all of this crucial information into a unified index so that each party can optimize efficiently. The main criticism I've seen of web monetization is in regards to privacy. Basically, the concern is about identity data being tracked and linked to the content and websites that users send streaming payments to. But I've heard COIL founders say in presentations that they do not know what sites a user visits. Um, but I haven't yet heard them say exactly how they're protecting user privacy, so I hope to learn more about that in my upcoming interview with Stefan Thomas. Although I was super skeptical of web monetization and the forces behind it, before I did all of this research, I was really stoked to discover that the people behind web monetization and COIL share really similar technical thinking and values to us. I'm sort of hoping that Stefan Thomas is like a real life Jordan McDear or something. You know, you look like one of them, but you talk like one of us. I'll find out when we talk and report back. Editing Amy here. He is. You're not going to want to miss the interview. My hope is that as a high profile and well-funded leader in the space, he can help to shift the conversation and make room for ideas that have previously been forbidden, like micropayments. He's even said in presentations that it wouldn't work if the web monetization standard gave COIL a competitive advantage over other web monetization service providers and that the protocol is the wrong place to look for that advantage, but that there are still lots of ways to compete at the proprietary 
app wear. I can't tell you the number of people who have looked at me like I was an alien or something when we told them that we don't want to build a moat around OIP to give Alexandria a competitive advantage. So it was truly thrilling to hear someone as huge in the industry as Stefan Thomas say that they don't want one either. In their talks, the COIL team also emphasized that they believe openness and interoperability are more important than having a competitive advantage when building a web standard, which is just music to my ears. They even talk about how they want competitors to build different flavors of apps on the open standard and that they realize that users of another web monetization app aren't necessarily users they lost. They may never have been the kind of user that they would serve. And that the real power of a standard is that everyone should be able to use it equally. Just listen to this clip of their CTO for a second. I think that's actually an important detail of web monetization as opposed to other, um, other payment mechanisms is that you can basically have all these different providers who have unique features among them, but they're all accessing the same content. So it's kind of like having a standard way to express, here's how you can pay for this content. And then the actual providers of it get to, you can choose them among who has the best unique offerings and features without, without having to say, okay, Netflix has a better user interface than Hulu, but it doesn't have the show that I want on it. You, don't, you wouldn't have that problem anymore. What more is there to say? We are all about tearing down the siloed walled gardens. If you have thoughts on web monetization or questions about how you can use it as a creator, leave a comment down below or hit me up on Twitter or Instagram at Amy of Alexandria and follow the channel at Open Index Proto. Don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe to the channel and share the video. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time. Thank you.